Welcome to another episode of Faithfully Podcast, the flagship podcast of Faithfully Magazine, owned and operated by Faithfully Media. In this episode, you'll hear Associate Editor Timothy Isaiah Cho speak with Bridget Eileen Rivera, blogger of the popular website Meditations of a Traveling Nun. Rivera is also author of Heavy Burdens, Seven Ways LGBTQ Christians Experience Harm in the Church. In Heavy Burdens, she examines how Christian faith communities alienate and condemn LGBTQ people and outlines a path for churches to develop a better approach. Yeah, well, thanks so much for taking the time to, to talk about um, just about yourself, your work, and also um, this book that's coming out really soon. Um, I'd love to just start out by opening it really broad here. Just if you could share a little bit about your background um, and also your work. Yeah, so I was raised in a Christian home, conservative evangelical. I was homeschooled, part of the homeschool evangelical movement. Uh, and I went to a very conservative um, college for homeschool graduates called Patrick Henry College. Um, and uh, I guess that's kind of um, very central to kind of which, what has shaped me as a person. I'm, I'm still a Christian to this day. I'm still very thankful for my um, conservative evangelical upbringing. I feel like it provided me a lot of foundations um, for life and everything. Um, today, I am getting my PhD in sociology, and I do a lot of LGBTQ advocacy. I've got a book coming out on the 26th of October uh, called Heavy Burdens. And that book is uh, about the experiences of discrimination in the church that LGBTQ people have. And um, I think it's a very important topic um, right now, especially as I think that um, these issues are reaching a point where churches can't ignore them anymore. And so I'm really hoping that this book can be a part of uh, making the church uh, a healthier place for queer people. Awesome. Um, you've shared in the past publicly, I believe, on your blog about um, kind of growing up in conservative evangelicalism and also uh, realizing that you were you were gay as well, and how there's kind of a, a meshing of those two stories. And also, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, do you? identify yourself in a kind of a conservative reform sort of uh, expression of faith right now? Yeah, I, I still see myself as uh, participating in the, uh, I guess, conservative tradition, um, the more traditional approach to understanding scripture. Um, I have a lot, a lot of reformed influences on my theology, um, and I think I could still consider myself reformed in a lot of ways, but maybe with some asterisks here and there. Sure. Um, and I, I grew up in a reformed Baptist church and that was probably the single most, um, the single biggest influence on my development theologically. And so, um, I, I definitely am still influenced by that to this day. Uh, and I guess I, I tend to seek out more conservative reformed churches in general, mm -hmm. um, Though right now I uh, am attending a Methodist church, um, but Reformed churches are kind of where I typically find my theological home. Sure, sure. Can you kind of touch on that as well? Just you know, being in and around kind of conservative Reformed um, circles and churches, and also um, your journey of realizing that you're gay as well, and for LGBTQ advocacy. Mm -hmm. How have those two kind of stories, you know? collided sometimes? How have they gone together sometimes in terms of the theology? I'd love to just hear just the interweaving of those two stories in your life. Yeah, so uh, being raised in a Reformed Baptist church, the way that LGBTQ issues were brought up to me was in the context of the passage in scripture where um, the Bible talks about vessels of wrath that um, were prepared by God for destruction. And um, this was taught to me um, within the reform context of being a predestined thing 
um, and that this was just this was just the way things were. Uh, queer people were vessels of wrath, condemned by God, and they were going to hell. Um, and it, it it was never necessarily explicitly stated that this is who queer pe people were, but whenever there was moments uh, where different things were brought up around sin, around hell, especially vessels of wrath, queer people would be brought up as an example of this. Um, and in one sermon in particular, which I talk about in my book, um, there was one sermon where the pastor was talking about vessels of wrath and he used queer people as an example of this. And it just really, really embedded itself in to my mind. Um, and really became an essential way that I thought about queer people. Um, for the rest of my childhood into my adult years, I didn't figure out that I was gay um, until I was uh, in college. And even then I didn't really think of it as being gay. It was just really me starting to realize, oh, I'm attracted to women. Hmm, what could that mean? Um, and I eventually came to terms with, oh my gosh, like this means that I have an experience that makes me the person that my pastor was talking about in that sermon. Uh, and it was absolutely terrifying. Realizing that I was gay was one of the most terrifying moments of my life. And um, the idea that I could be condemned by God um, outside of any control that I had over it, that this was just a predestined thing, that I was a vessel of wrath, just it like it crushed me, absolutely crushed me. Um, I, uh, you know, being reformed had, you know, the perspective that, you know, once saved, always saved, you can't lose your salvation. Um, but then there's also the other side of that, which is, um, if you reach a point where you discover that you're not saved after having thought that you were saved, and that means you never were saved ever to begin with. And so I'm starting to like fear that wondering like, oh my gosh, like maybe I was never saved. Maybe I was deceived the whole time. Um, and it was just, it was a terrifying time. Um, and I really really started to struggle with the possibility that despite my love for God, um, despite my commitment to follow him, um, I was nevertheless predestined um, to not be saved and to go to hell, uh, despite no matter what I do, um, that inevitably at some point in my life, it was going to just um, come out and really be exposed that I was never a true believer and was already being exposed because I'm gay. Um, at the same time, because I had grown up in a reformed church, I had a, uh, I guess the reformed church that I grew up in was very, very strong theologically. Um, I went to tons of classes as a child, learning all sorts of theology, um, memorizing scripture. And so I started to have kind of scripture and what I had been taught battling against these other concepts that I was struggling with. Um, and I started to realize that a lot of these ideas around gay people being condemned by God were a twisting of um, the Bible, a twisting of Reformed theology to make it say things that actually it doesn't need to say, it shouldn't say. Um, and I guess a big one for me was just realizing um, that the concept of perseverance of the saints um, is one that I could hold on to as, uh, I guess, um, I don't know, a source of comfort and knowing that God really has saved me, that I am his child. Um, and uh, one verse in particular um, in the Bible where it says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Um, that really spoke to me in that moment. Um, and made me realize that 
this whole thing um, is so small in the eyes of God. Uh, me being gay, me being attracted to women. That is like such a small thing. Um, it is uh, not something that can get in the way of his grace. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Um, and so I didn't need to be terrified of this experience that I was having um, because God was going to walk with me in that. Um, he does not leave us or forsake us. Um, he walks with us. Um, he holds us in the palm of his hand um, and, none, and nothing can snatch us away. Um, and so grounding myself in the, those truths helped me to regain a confidence in God's love and regain a confidence in knowing that regardless of the things and the questions that I was asking, the experiences that I was having, God was going to hold my hand through all of it. He wasn't going to let go. Um, and he was going to help me work through all of this. Thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah. Um, you know, you talked about how there were some really bad and false sort of concepts that you heard about talking about queer people, about gay people in your upbringing. Were there any authors or books that were influential for you that were helpful as you thought about faith and sexuality? And the second part of that question would be, um, what was missing in those books that made you want to write Heavy Burdens? Yeah, um, this might sound, the, the two books that I am thinking of that come to mind might sound maybe a little random to some people, um, but they were actually very influential for me um, in my own development. The first is Paul Among the People by Sarah Rudin. Um, and it's a tiny little book, not super large, not super expensive. Uh, and uh, I stumbled upon it um, at the recommendation of a couple of different people. And so, um, Several different people had recommended it, finally bought it, read it. And it was the first time that I had read a book that truly contextualized Paul in his time. Um, it truly brought Paul to life, given the situation historically that he was in and the people that he was speaking to. Um, and it was just, wow so world-changing, so eye-opening, um, because Paul for so long had been taught to me um, just in a very kind of rote, um, let's quote this verse, Paul, you know, Paul said this, therefore, this is how it is. Um, and, you know, to, to the point where, um, you know, even verses that talk about women needing to wear head coverings were taken very literally. And um, so I was told that I should wear a head covering uh, when I was growing up. Um, and Sarah Rudin, she kind of takes Paul and contextualizes him. And it really made me realize that we have to look at scripture um, as a document that um, exists in a time and a place um, and how easy it is for us to force onto scripture, to read into it, our own understanding of the world, our own framework for thinking about the universe and read that into scripture instead of taking time to understand the world that it was written in um, and and allowing that to then speak to us today um, from within its own context. Um, so that one was the first one. Uh, the other one is going to probably sound a little strange to some people. Um, there's a book called, uh, two books called Xenocide and Children of the Mind by Orson Scott Card. These are uh, fiction books. Um, Orson Scott Card, um, he, he's the author who wrote Ender's Game. Um, Ender's Game is one of my favorite books of all time. And fiction in general has had a huge influence on me as a person, uh, probably more actually than nonfiction books, because I think um, fiction storytelling just has a way of getting at really profound truths. Um, so... In Xenocide and Children of the Mind, Orson Scott Card, he tells the story of a girl who grows up in this culture 
Um, and they believe that certain children within this culture are born and sort of predestined by their God to be his servant um, in very specific ways. Um, and the way that manifests is they are given some kind of task that they have to repeat over and over and over and over and over again for the rest of their lives in order to serve their God. And they have no choice in this. They have been chosen. They have to do this task. Um, oftentimes the task is extremely menial. They have to do it over and over and over and over again. Um, and uh, this girl um, is discovered to have been chosen by God to serve him in this way. And her task that she has to do is she has to trace the lines in the wood um, on the floor of a room, up and down the room all day long, one line at a time, all the way up, the next line, all the way down. She has to do that like every day, all day, except for when she's sleeping and then like eating um, for the rest of her life. Um, and so she does it. She's extremely faithful. She believes that this is doing a service to her God. Uh, by the end of her story, it winds up coming out that this whole thing was actually a hoax, um, that God had never actually told anyone um, in this culture that there would be anyone chosen to do this menial task, that it, it was all not true. Um, but this girl was so convinced that she was doing a service to God that nobody could tell her otherwise. Um, and she could not be reasoned with. So she lived the rest of her days until she was like old and shriveled up and dying, tracing the lines of wood on the floor. Um, and, uh, okay. So why did that story impact me? Um, really impacted me because, um, I didn't want to serve God in a way that was meaningless. I didn't want to serve God, um, and give him something that I thought was this grand display of faithfulness, but actually did not mean anything in the end. Um, and so, um, for me, that was thinking about celibacy, um, I, I am celibate. I do follow a traditional sexual ethic, but I didn't want to, I didn't want that to be something that I just did that was meaningless, had no point to it. I was just doing it because God told me to do it. And therefore I had to do it. I wanted to make sure that this came from um, a place that made sense to me. Um, and um, that I knew was, um, going to be something that, um, was an expression, uh, of my faith, um, that brought meaning to my life. Um, cause I don't think that, uh, God asks us to do things that don't ultimately make our lives better. Um, ultimately, um, make us better people in the end. Um, Obviously, there might be things he asks us that make our lives more difficult, but um, I think in the end, the things that God asks us to do uh, make our lives better. And so I wanted to make sure that if I chose celibacy, that it wasn't coming from this meaningless place of not having any understanding of why, not knowing what the point was. It's completely meaningless. I'm just doing it because God told me to. I didn't want that for myself. I wanted to do it because I really believed that this was the best life for me. Um, so all to say, um, those two books have been very influential on me and in thinking about my life, thinking about um, my understanding of the Bible and scripture and, and responding to God um, in my life through faith. That's powerful. Um, you know, one of the things turning towards your book here, Heavy Burdens, um, one of the things that struck me at reading your book was the fact that the book doesn't, um, provide kind of like a case for sexuality and faith, but rather it focuses more on 
the instances of these, you know, double standards, these extra heavy burdens that have been placed on LGBTQ identifying Christians. Um, I'd love to hear just why you decided to take that sort of tactic of uh, addressing it from that angle. Um, and if you, if, had you not seen that in other literature um, in, on the same topic, is, was that a reason why you jumped into it in that sort of uh, perspective? Uh, yes, uh, 100%. Um, that is the reason why I wanted to write this book. I had not seen any other book um, that had taken um, this issue from a perspective of let's step away from the sides and let's look at this as a whole picture. Um, I don't know of any books that do that. Um, any book that I've ever read always has a side that it is defending in some way. Um, and I think that that is a big mistake. I think it creates a false understanding of the queer Christian community because um, the queer people that I know in the church can't easily be divided into sides. Um, a lot of people are really kind of confused about what they think and what they believe. And they're just wanting space to kind of think through it and explore and try to figure out what God is asking them to do. Um, you know, they're wanting to be able to just read the Bible and see what it says. And um, the actual queer Christian community in the actual world is not this way. It's not divided into sides. Like people are way more complicated than that. Um, and so I wanted to set aside the theological issues that we love to argue about and be like, let's actually look at what is actually happening on the ground, what queer experiences actually are in the church. And from there, let's think about what the implications are for us as a church. Um, and so one thing that I do talk about in the book and that I do acknowledge is that I do come from a traditional sexual ethic. I do come from a perspective um, that uh, follows the more conservative reading of scripture that defines marriage as a union between man and woman for the purpose of procreation. Um, and because of that, I'm celibate. I do come from that perspective. Um, however, I am not the only gay person that is in the church. Um, the, the gay community is, the queer community is so much more diverse than just me. Um, and my sexual ethic is not the thing that makes the hurt I've experienced in the church worth acknowledging. Um, just because I happen to be on the traditional side of things, that's not what makes my story worthwhile for Christians to hear and consider. Um, I uh, want to see Christians hear and consider the stories of people um, who come from the progressive side of things, um, who affirm same-sex marriage, because those people's stories are valuable too. Um, and they have a lot to teach us about what is going on in the church. Um, every person is made in the image of God and uh, God uh, um, is counting the, the tears of every queer person in the church, not just the ones that happen to agree with a traditional side. Um, God cares about every single queer person in the church and the hurt that they've experienced, the tears that they've shed. Um, and Ultimately, um, we need to be, we need to have a, a goal of making the church a safe place for all queer people, um, regardless of where they might be um, in the debate over sexual ethics. Because as long as the church is saying, we will treat you well if you agree with us, then the church is not treating queer people well. The church has to treat queer people well, period, regardless of sexual ethics. And so that's what my book wanted to get at um, and wanted to get away from these sides and needing to pick a side and just talk about queer people, their experiences in the church and how to do better. Awesome. Um, another thing in your book, uh, you know, there's a lot of 
books and podcasts are going out now about the danger and damage that complementarianism, gender roles, biblical manhood and womanhood, all, you know, all those things have done in the church or for decades. Um, one of the things that, how that intersects with your book is how those sort of deep-seated ideas of masculinity, femininity, so on and so forth, also deeply impact the ways that LGBTQ Christians have experienced harm in the church. Um, mm -hmm. Can you touch on a couple of the ways that you've seen that intersection where complementarianism, gender roles, uh, has impacted the atmosphere and the culture that is impacting the way that LGBTQ Christians are being treated in the church? Yeah, it's, it's huge. Um, it's 100% something that impacts queer people at a very fundamental level. Um, so the whole idea of gender roles where there's men and there's women and there's very strict definitions of what a godly man needs to be and there's very strict definitions of what a godly woman needs to be um, these things create very very tight boxes um, that only certain people can fit in and uh, in my experience most queer people don't fit into those boxes uh, gay men um, are often uh, just lambasted by Christians for their effeminacy, um, condemned for being, uh, you know, having limp wrists or, you know, dressing, dressing in, you know, floral attire or, you know, that like there's these gay stereotypes of gay men being effeminate. And um, I can't even count the number of sermons where I've seen pastors make fun of gay men for acting like women. Uh, and it gets to this whole idea that being a man is defined by how good you are at removing any vestiges of femininity that you could possibly have in your personality, like purging yourself of all of them and being a man. Um, like that's how we often look at masculinity. It's like this absence of anything that could be feminine. Um, and so, you know, the most manly of men is the one that is as opposite of being a woman as he can possibly be. And the, the worst kind of men are the ones that um, allow themselves to express these things that the culture sees as being more feminine. And of course we know, and this has been demonstrated time and time again, this whole idea of what is feminine, what is masculine. Um, it's very socially constructed. Uh, and not, it's not this kind of objective thing um, that um, is the same for all times and in all places. Um, and the interesting thing is that the writings um, by the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood admit this. They actually acknowledge that gender roles are culturally defined. Uh, but interesting, interestingly enough, and I talk about this in the book, um, they would say that that's a good thing, that the culture defines what a man should look like and what a woman should look like. And therefore, if you want to be a godly man, you need to play in to what the culture says manhood looks like. Same for being a woman. Um, and I don't think that that is actually biblical. I think that scripture calls us to transform the culture um, and to challenge uh, the way that our culture thinks. Um, and I, I think that not everyone, when you create boxes, you are by definition creating insiders and outsiders. Um, and just because gay men don't live up to the perfect ideal of masculinity in our culture, doesn't mean that they aren't men. Same thing for women. Women are, are slightly different um, in that femininity or womanhood is um, in a lot of Christian circles defined by serving the men around you, being submissive to the men around you. Um, and so, um, I wish I could have included this quote in my book, but there was a really, really good quote um, in a, a book I read recently on queer theory 
um, that basically talks about how um, the stereotype of the dyke, the you know burly lesbian dyke versus the slutty whore. Um, that we've got these two kind of warring things on either side, um, and women are told you can't be this burly, unattractive dyke because no man would ever want you. Um, and you can't, like, you don't want to be a whore because, you know, that's like, you know, like men are just going to use you. Like they're not going to actually respect you. You want to be this like perfect woman in the middle. Um, and so, you know, women are defined by how attractive they are to men, um, how much they appeal to men, how well they serve men, how well they protect their sexual purity. Um, and it's, it's harmful. It's very harmful to women because it robs them of their humanity um, and defines it instead by how well they are serving men. And um, for queer women, um, they're often um, treated as though um, they are, uh, I guess, I guess the stereotype of the lesbian is again, this like, you know, this, you know, big old burly woman that no man wants to have. And like, this is supposed to be, you know, a negative thing uh, because, you know, you're, you're not supposed to be like that. Um, so it's very harmful. It creates um, outsiders once again, um, makes queer women feel like uh, they have nothing to offer the church um, because they don't have a man that um, is giving their life meaning. <clears throat> Um, it, kind of piggybacking off of that last question too, um, in your book, you talk about the idea of gender essentialism, and you also draw parallels between that and other forms of essentialism that have mm -hmm. caused a lot of damage, you know, things including like r race essentialism. Um, mm -hmm. Can you help define what essentialism is and just kind of, you know, show these sort of parallels between gender essentialism and other kinds that have done lots of damage um, in the church? Yeah, so um, this is a really, really big one. Um, so um, essentialism is, in a nutshell, the idea that biology determines your identity. Um, what we are um, in our body and our biological reality determines who we are. Um, what we are determines who we are. That's, that's basically essentialism in a nutshell. So um, gender essentialism um, is the idea that your sex, your sexual biology determines your uh, gender identity. So what your sexual biology is de determines who your gender is. Uh, and it's, it's something that has a lot of parallels, um, believe it or not, um, to Darwinistic thinking. It's very heavily embedded um, in um, an evolutionary conception of human identity that sees everything as a product of um, natural biological um, phenomena. Um, and so you, you see this in the development of uh, conceptions of race. Um, scientists would look at your brain size, the size of your skull, um, you know, the length of your brows, the size of your nose, and from there, decide a host of different things. They would decide whether you were going to be a criminal, whether you were going to be lazy, if you were going to be crazy, if you were like, they, uh, they believed that these biological physical things defined who people were. Um, and it was used um, in the area of race 100%, um, which you alluded to. Um, it was one of the main ways that scientists attempted to prove that um, people um, from African and indigenous communities were inferior to um, those from European backgrounds. Um, and they would do that again by appealing to biology, to appealing to the color of 
their skin. Um, this is a clear mark of biological inferiority, um, which means that they are less human. Um, and um, it was used uh, to um, just kind of create a whole system where we could define humanity along this hierarchy of less or of inferior all the way up to the most superior human beings. And of course, we know the history of this. It led, um, social Darwinism led to some of the worst atrocities of um, the 20th century. The Holocaust um, is probably the most notable. Um, and and uh, Hitler, you know, really believed that he could create um, a superior race. Um, and, you know, his you know, mission to eradicate disabled people and all these different groups is really based upon this biological essentialism. Um, and so we know, um, like biological essentialism really faded from view after, after the Holocaust because um, it was just so evident how perverted it was, how awful it was, the, the um, absolute tragedies that resulted from it. It really faded from view. Um, but there has been a resurgence uh, specifically in gender essentialism uh, where people have this idea that your sexual biology is, is something that ultimately determines who you become. Um, and um, the way that this is proven is through um, like this, this discussion of how sexual biology has evolved over time. And um, they'll look at, um, scientists will look at the scientific evolution of ants, for example, and be like, okay, so we can see how the sexual biology of this ant and this ant, they evolved in this way to create um, this kind of interaction um, and therefore um, uh, they are who they are. Um, and then this logic is used and applied to human beings. And it's really interesting. You can actually look at writing um, from the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, their main book actually refers um, regularly to um, animal biology um, and animal behavior in order to make conclusions about human beings. Uh, and I just think that this assumption that our sexual biology determines who we are, I really think that Christians need to take a step back and really question, is this true? Um, I don't think that, you know, that necessarily means that we need to come out and say that sexual biology has nothing to do with who we are, um, but does everybody relate to their sexual biology in the same way? Um, you know, certainly our biology is important. We're all physical beings, um, but is it really determinative um, in the way so many people say? Um, the way I was raised, I was raised with an understanding that people are created in the image of God um, but we are more than just highly evolved monkeys. Um, we are more than just highly evolved biological mechanisms. Um, and so that would speak to this idea that the human identity is, is more than just a collection of our biological organs all coming together to, to make us who we are. There's something more mysterious there. Um, and so I think that there needs to be a willingness to just take a step back and really think about what Christians are saying when they say that who you are sexually determines who you are as a human being. Um, I really think that we just need to pause for a minute and think about it and really consider the implications of a statement like that. Hmm. That's just fascinating just to see the, the social Darwinist, um, mm -hmm. you know, origins of that. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Mm. Um, my next question, uh, so from my understanding, you are of Cuban descent? 
Puerto Rican. Puerto Rican. You're Puerto yes. Rican descent. Sorry about that. No, it's fine. Um, can you, are there ways in which, um, you know, your Puerto Rican heritage has impacted both your faith and also your journey as an, as a gay Christian? Uh, are there ways in which it's been helpful? Has it been hurtful and not very helpful in other ways? Uh, are there unique challenges even in general for LGBTQ Christians who are also racialized minorities? Yeah, this is like a, a really big one. So um, I am Puerto Rican on my mom's side and I'm um, Irish on my dad's side. So I have family um, in both Puerto Rico um, as well as Ireland, actually. I've, I've visited Puerto Rico, but I've never visited Ireland. Um, that's something that's on my bucket list um, that I'd like to do. Um, my um, culture is very important to me. Um, I was raised um, to value um, both sides of my heritage um, and to um, celebrate both sides. Um, so, you know, I grew up in a, a very mixed culture, mixed, not just mixed culture, mixed race, mixed ethnicity. Um, and so one thing that being mixed taught me is that identity is complicated. You can't just say my identity is in Christ and call it a day. Um, identity is a very, very complex thing. Um, and uh, saying my identity in Christ, it just doesn't cut it. Um, uh, okay, yes, my identity is in Christ. Christ does define who I am, but like, what does that's kind of a useless statement to me because what does it even mean at the end of the day? <laughs> in my like daily lived reality in the world that I am in and how I am embodied in reality, how I am, what my personality is, how I express myself, um, what the world looks like to me. Um, like, yes, my identity is in Christ, but if that means that like all of us are just going to like be absorbed into Christ and lose everything of who we are. Um, well, I mean, that kind of sounds like, I don't know, some uh, very mystical religion that I remember honestly being criticized when I was a child, this idea of like becoming one with the energy of the world and like just losing your personality, losing your individuality. Um, that whole concept is like a very mystical religious concept that, I don't know, the Christians that raised me, like we're like, that's bad. Um, you know, Christ doesn't ask us to lose our individuality. Um, Christ, you know, keeps us whole as individuals, even as we are becoming one in him. And that's like, that's the mystery. That's the paradox of Christianity that we um, are one body in Christ with many members, right? Like we are one, but also many. Um, we are unified, but also individuals. That is something that is unique um, within Christianity. And I think that um, it needs to be remembered when we're talking about identity in Christ. And so, yeah, being mixed taught me identity is more complicated. And it was actually um, because of my experience as a mixed race person, um, as a Puerto Rican, um, that made me comfortable with using um, language that I guess a lot of Christians are often uncomfortable with, like saying that you're gay or saying that um, you're queer, um, because I already had an understanding that I wasn't saying this is the ultimate thing that I am. Um, this is just part of my experience in the world. And, you know, when I like go up to someone and tell them that I'm Puerto Rican, I'm like not trying to tell them that like this defines me ultimately. And like, obviously there's more about me than just that, but this is important. <laughs> this has like a huge impact on my whole life. Um, and so um, I, I often find that when I'm talking to people of color, um, that there is a much, it's much easier to talk about the complexity of identity um, and the reasons why um, language is important for queer people in order to name their experiences. Because I think that um, as people of color, we already have that understanding that like we need names to 
to talk about things. Um, and that, that doesn't mean we're trying to like, you know, create, you know, these ultimate identities out of the single one label. Um, I, I think you, you also um, asked about like what unique challenges um, queer Christians face who are also racialized minorities. Um, I think that um, is a really important question to be thinking about. Um, racialized minorities, there's layers of discrimination that people of color face um, racially, sexually, on gender levels. Um, there's so many layers. Uh, you know, some people would use the term intersectionality, though that's kind of a little bit of a trigger word these days. Um, one thing that I think is, you know, important to talk about is that Black trans women have one of the highest murder rates in the country, um, if not the highest murder rate, uh, because um, they face so much discrimination, just layer upon layer of discrimination. Um, and so, you know, uh, we can talk about the uh, um, experiences of marginalization, um, but uh, we also need to talk about how um, uh, different effects kind of pile on to people at different times. Um, and uh, create just a lot of exhaustion um, and a lot of isolation and exclusion for people um, to a degree that, you know, um, if you are a, a white gay man, you might think you understand, but maybe you don't really. Um, and so um, for racialized minorities, a lot of times the layers of discrimination are so much heavier, so much more extreme. Um, and there's definitely a history um, behind this. Uh, something that a lot of people don't know is that a lot of our ideas of sexual purity are attached to our ideas of whiteness in the United States. Um, uh, you know, back when the concept of race was being developed, there was this idea that the white race was sexually pure and black and indigenous races were inherently um, promiscuous. Um, and so sexual purity was defined as something that only white people could have. Um, and so that like, that continues up until today and a lot of the stereotypes that we have um, of, uh, you know, black men you know, prowling around looking for white women to rape, um, you know, black women, um, you know, prowling around as prostitutes looking for, you know, white men to seduce, uh, you know, the concept of a Jezebel. Um, a lot of times uh, Latina women are stereotyped as being, you know, these exotic, sexually voracious kind of uh, te temptresses, you know, these, these stereotypes um, continue to this day and um, it impacts the experiences that um, POCs have um, who are queer um, on a number of, of levels um, because they not only have these stereotypes that they're dealing with, um, they also have the stereotypes of gay people being pedophiles and um, all of this. And when you think about heterosexuality and needing to achieve this heterosexual ideal, um, that heterosexual ideal is also a white ideal. So if you are um, a black gay man, you are not just in order to be accepted by society being told that you need to be straight, you're also being told that you need to be white because whiteness and straightness go together. Um, and the same you know, we could talk, you know, down the line for, you know, so many different experiences. That's really helpful. Um, you know, each chapter in your book shares, you know, very painful stories, at least one or two stories of, you know, LGBTQ people experiencing harm at the hands of the church. And, you know, I'm thinking about it, certain strands in conservative evangelicalism um, will, you know, they'll try to say, well, we don't want to talk about 
uh, personal aspects or emotions. We just want to be objective about things. We don't want to hear stories. Um, why did you think it was imp uh, Im important to include these stories and to kind of push back against that sort of like, let's try to be objective kind of um, narrative? Yeah, I, I think that, yes, it is important to pursue objectivity. Um, it is important to uh, want to prioritize um, being intellectually sound, being well-reasoned in the judgments we make. Um, but we also have to understand the real world impact of um, what we are talking about. And I think that there is sometimes this idea in um, Christian circles that rationality and objectivity exist outside of the fall, that we can reason our way to a perfect conclusion and sin does not impact our judgment at all in any way. We reasoned our way to this. It was logical. It made sense. The Bible said this, the Bible said that, therefore this, and it's perfect. And like, there's this idea that the fall doesn't impact any of that. That sin has not been, uh, you know, having an effect on our judgment at all. And uh, the truth is it does. <laughs> how people think, how people reason is affected by sin. Um, and so, you know, if we are relying on our intellect, our objective understanding of rationality um, to come to the truth, uh, we are going to end up deceiving ourselves <laughs> and having this idea that we are, you know, we have the absolute truth when we don't. We have just created a deception um, that, you know, we get to tell other people is perfect and objective. Um, and so I think it's important to uh, uh, balance our desire for reasoned and informed opinions with real world stories of what is actually going on in the experiences and the subjective realities of everyday people. Um, because, you know, we can, you know, talk about ABC one, two, three. But then we also need to feel what other people are feeling. Um, we also need to see through other people's eyes. Um, and in doing so, we might discover truths that our reason alone never brought us to uh, because uh, we are all fallen human beings and we are not going to see everything. There's things that we're going to miss. Um, and sometimes walking in another person's shoes, seeing through another person's eyes, feeling what they feel, um, will expose to us things that we have never considered before things that we have never, uh, incorporated into our little formulas for thinking about the universe. Um, and so it's, it's essential that we include real world experiences, real world stories of actual people, actual human beings, um, in order to have a balanced understanding of what reality is actually like. That's great. Um, the last question I have for you is, um, what are your hopes and prayers uh, for the fruit that will come out from people uh, reading your book? Yeah, um, my biggest hope and prayer is for change. Um, the church is just, it's not a safe place right now and for, for queer people. And I know a lot of people roll their eyes at the idea of um, people needing a safe place. It feels like I'm, you know, you know, wanting the church to become, you know, a place where, you know, special snowflakes can just feel comfortable, but that's not what I'm talking about. Um, when I talk about the church not being a safe place, I am talking about queer people committing suicide. I'm talking about queer people dying. Um, I'm not talking about queer people being uncomfortable, though that does happen, um, and that is a symptom of it. But ultimately, um, what we're talking about is people dying 
in our churches, under our watch, under our discipleship. Um, I have heard so many stories of people who have attempted suicide under the direction of a church, under the discipleship of a church, um, as a direct consequence of what they were being told. Um, they despaired of life itself. They believed that life was no longer worth living. Um, and there is a reason for this. Um, and it, it, it's something that can no longer be ignored. Um, and I want that to change. I want the church to become a place where queer people can walk in and actually grow spiritually instead of being crushed, where they can, uh, they can sit down in a pew and uh, find a space that helps them develop as a person um, and, and strengthen their relationship with God instead of finding it destroyed, um, finding their faith just completely shattered. Um, and uh, ultimately, um, I don't want there to be um, any more uh, queer people who die in our churches. I, I do not want to see one more queer person die. Um, and so my, my hope and prayer for this book is that um, it can spark change, that it can spark conversations um, and ultimately um, push, push the church down a road that will um, lead to healthier outcomes for queer people. Thank you for listening to this episode of Faithfully Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing to the show via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. If you'd like to join Faithfully Magazine and its mission to keep Christian media diverse, consider becoming a Faithfully Magazine partner subscriber. Just head to faithfullymagazine.com to learn more.